If you're only doing any, if you're really good, you make big bucks. <laughs> if you're long relief, they don't have anybody else. So they stick you in there to take the beating. Name Dan Stokes. I am connected to Ethnos 360, which you know better as New Tribes Mission. Tonight we'll talk a little bit about why we sh shifted our name from New Tribes to Ethnos 360. Got a call on Thursday night from Pastor Steve, and I saw it on my cell phone, and I'm like, he, want, he wants to go sight his gun in. <laughs> so I'm looking, looking, at, oh, we're going to talk about where, where we're going to meet and all that stuff, and he didn't sound good. He said, Dan, can you cover for me on Sunday? I said, yeah, I can cover for you on Sunday. And he said, we, we haven't got rid of the stuff. I said, I've heard that story before. <laughs> and so that's how I show up here this morning. Actually, I think I've said this before but when I've been here. I think I know Steve and Lynn, or Lenny as some of you call her, when they were actually students at the Bible school a good 40 plus years ago. Uh, I'm not even sure they were married when I first met them. So I've known them for a long time, appreciated their ministry. Uh, Steve did ask me if I would emphasize why you me? So we're going to start our service out by April playing a little why you me why you me video. My folks served as missionaries, uh, so I had that firsthand experience of growing up overseas. Uh, a couple of the main things that I care about are the Lord and His mission in the world. So that would mean people from really every tribe, tongue, and nation coming to know Him as their Savior. I think another thing that's very important to me is that people in America begin to care about that. I think that very few of them are really aware of God's bigger global purposes. Africa's very far away. Asia's very far away. They've never seen the sights and the sounds. They, they haven't seen the dying and the lost people. And so I felt pretty convicted early on that whether or not the Lord was going to have me go to the mission field or not, I needed to be a voice piece here so people could see. Before we came to Wyumi, a lot of the burden to spread awareness about global missions and God's purpose in the world was on me as a youth pastor. I actually was invited down uh, to a couple different uh, sessions. It was the first time that I had heard kind of the chronological teaching and this big mission that God was doing from the beginning of time in a condensed way. And I remember the fact that it was condensed really impacted me because I, I thought it's important for people to see that big picture in a quick shot. And uh, what I found very beneficial about Wyumi was we were able to bring all our kids for a specific period of time. All of them were here for all the teaching. They were in every session. And I found that having that concentrated week uh, might have beat out a whole year of trying to convince them of what God's doing in the world. And so for me, Wyumi helps people see. So that it's not theory, they have to see it. And Wyumi helps paint the picture. And it gives people an idea of what the first step might be for them to be involved. My favorite thing about Wyumi is that they do it all. And, and as a youth pastor, that's a big deal. At many of our previous events, it was all on me or my wife or our team to make it happen where now most of my time can actually be doing follow-up and discipleship, asking questions. Wyumi has greatly affected our ministry. Our, our kids have obviously been getting a message of what God's been doing in the world through our youth group. They get that year-round. But Wyumi really put a stamp on it. it. It energized them. It gave them a surge. So that gives me a dynamic context to follow up with them on. You know, weeks later, what did you think about that? How is God using that in your life? 
You know, what did you remember about that? You know, and that, that context is very, very important uh, because we didn't want Wyumi to just end at Wyumi. Uh, we wanted the ripple effect to go out where some of our kids were now considering going to Bible school to train to be a missionary. Or where some of our kids would want to come back and help serve at, at Wyumi. Wyumi is part of uh, Ethnos 360. Um, it is not just in the summer for young people. It really operates 12 months a year. And if you have a missions team or interest in missions, you are welcome to go. We can give you information. And if you want to see how we actually do it in a tribe, Come look at Wyumi. I think after you see it, you'll say, we're going to have to start doing it that way in this country. Um, tonight, we'll kind of look at how missions has changed in the last 40, 50 years, uh, and how the, some of those changes have even affected, like we were, I was speaking to a lady earlier this morning, how it's even affected our own name. But uh, for some reason, as I prayed and thought about what I wanted to cover today here for you, I wanted to cover a subject that I don't think you're unfamiliar with. I think you're probably, knowing Steve, very familiar with. The rapture of the church. Now, one of the reasons I think I feel urged to do this because... Uh, First of all, there's a lot of confusions uh, about the uh, rapture of the church. Depending on what theological bent you are and what pastor you follow, or radio preacher or TV preacher, um, will affect your view. And I, I'm a proponent that you don't let those affect your view I propose that you let the Bible affect your view. Now, I'm going to give you some views and even try to call them by what they are properly called. One of the movements today is the church and Israel are the same. There's a lot of teaching uh, in good churches where as you listen to the pastor teach, he is saying the promises to Israel apply to the church. The term or name for that is covenant theology. In other words, the covenants that were promised to Israel now apply to the church. Another view is the church will go through part of the tribulation. Might refer to that as partial rapture or mid-tribulation view. Then there's those that occur that the uh, rapture will occur at the end of the tribulation, which would be uh, a post view. I will give you a view that I heard about 40 plus years ago. It is one of the most humorous views I've ever heard. And when I first heard it, I wasn't paying attention. I was sitting in a Baptist church on a Sunday morning, I mean Sunday evening, uh, when I was in teaching at the institute we worked at for the mission. And I don't know about you guys, but sometimes on Sunday night if I'm in a church, I'm not really paying attention to everything that's being, anybody guilty of stuff like that? I was tired, and I actually was in charge of work detail at the, at the institute. And I was thinking about work detail projects we had to work on on Monday. Guilty. And so I'm sitting there, and my wife elbows me in the side, like, you better listen to this stuff. And I'm like, okay, what's up? And so I'm glad he repeated what he had proposed. He believed that when the rapture of the church happens... 
I think he, could ble he believed it could happen at any time, but your rate of ascent would depend on your spirituality. Okay? So now those of you who would be considered not so spiritual, no, you only got a foot up. <laughs> you only want a foot off the ground. And then you came back down because there's more sanctification needed for you, see. But some of you would need a, would be a little better than a foot. Maybe you would be six feet up, and then you would come down. And I'm listening to this, I'm like, where in the Bible does he come up with some crazy view like this? And then he had people going way up. You know, maybe the pastors, maybe the missionaries. Maybe this Sunday school teacher is going some, maybe miles even up. And then they were come back down. And I'm like, that sounds dangerous. <laughs> it wouldn't pay to be very spiritual. <laughs> because if I'm, if I'm going to fall, I don't want to fall from a mile. I, I'll take six inches. <laughs> uh, it turned out I was on the deacon board. And in that church, the deacon board... Uh, served as the pulpit committee. The pastor had left and was looking for a new preacher. And so uh, they said, after service, we're going to have uh, question and answers from the pulpit committee for the candidate. And I'm like, man, I want to find out where you come up with this view, man. I've, I've heard a lot of things, and I thought I've read all the books on this stuff. I just kind of wonder where you got this idea from. So my first question was to him, where did you go to school? By the way, that's an important question because sometimes the school will indicate what you actually believe. Because until you get some experience, you don't necessarily believe or understand and really have a position. Now, you may say you have a position, but until your position is tested, you don't necessarily have a position. You're just answering the way the professors told you. Right? I mean, I, I, even today in school, you know, they, these kids go to school, then come back and they say, well, I believe in evolution. Who told you that? Well, Dr. So-and-so. Well, how old is Dr. So-and-so? He's 22. <laughs> and he has a doctorate in something, you know. Oh. By the way, you go to Wyoming, we'll show you where evolution cannot be true. We'll show you where it can't be true, just can't. So anyway, I'm there and I said, where'd you go to school? And he told me where he went to school. If you want to know, ask me tonight, I'll tell you where he went to school. I won't do it today. Make you come back tonight for that valuable information. And so uh, I said, uh, brother, I assumed he was a believer, so I said, brother, brother, where did you get that view? Uh, that's new to me. And he said, I was sitting in my room studying. And I thought about it. And they were my conclusions. If you've got a conclusion, test it with other people who might know as much or more than you. But he actually believed it. Uh, so I thought about that and was one of the weird, that's probably the weirdest I've ever actually heard. A, a biblical principle that is taught at Ethnos 360, and many, and there are fewer of them now, good Bible schools. You realize that there are fewer and fewer good Bible schools. Is that Israel is not the church. Principles that apply to Israel do not apply to the church. Now, if you take certain passages, for example, if you turn to Matthew 24, if you want to look at something, if you look at Matthew 24, People will say, this, this is the rapture of the church. 
And usually it's a case of where people have read some things, for example, starting with verse 7. For nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. Is that happening? Okay. There should be famines, pestilences, earthquakes in different places. By the way, I uh, got news this morning in Papua New Guinea where we have missionaries. Earthquake hit 7.7. 7. That would be massive. If that hit like Los Angeles, most of the Los Angeles probably would have crumbled. So earthquakes. These are the beginning of sorrows. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and then they shall kill you. And you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. Well, that's kind of happening to Christians, even here. And then shall many be offended, and shall betray one another, and shall hate one another, and many false prophets shall arise and deceive many. Any false prophets around? Turn on TV if you want to see some of them. Okay. And because the iniquity shall abound, and the love of many shall wax cold, but he that shall endure until the end, shall, that same shall be saved. Verse 14, this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached to all the world for a witness to all nations, and then shall the end come. Okay. Does that sound like today? A lot of, a lot of people say it does. Well, honestly, it sounded like that way for the last 2,000 years. If you study history, these problems have been going on since Jesus was here and went back to heaven. But if you kept reading the passage, you would come to the conclusion that, uh, wow, like verse 14. And this gospel of the kingdom. This is one of the things that probably got me on my high horses. How many people are talking about doing things for the kingdom? They eliminate the church. I'm not working for the kingdom as they emphasize it. The kingdom is all inclusive. I'm working for the church. And the church is what Jesus established. And he put my focus on the church. Bill Gaither sings that song that a lot of us like, Behold, the King is Coming. It sounds pretty good, but really, guess who's coming? The groom. The groom is, and guess who you are? You're the bride. You're the bride of Christ. If you notice in uh, Acts chapter 1, kind of helps us here, when uh, Jesus is almost ready to go back to heaven, we know all the events of the Gospels there, and the disciples came to him, and they, verse 6, and when they, when they were therefore come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, when you, will you restore the kingdom to Israel? And how does he answer? He answers with the Great Commission. At this point in time, the disciples did not know of this thing called the church. It didn't exist. There was only Israel, so their focus is on building a kingdom because they had lived under Roman rule and they suffered through Roman rule. So the interpretation from Acts chapter 2 on separates this from the Old Testament. Uh, okay, April, let's see if we can get that little slide to work. Maybe you've seen this. I can't make it any darker. If you've seen something like this, all it is doing is separating the church from the Old Testament. That doesn't mean you cannot use the Old Testament. 
But the Old Testament was written to who? Israel. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Who was that written to? Israel. <coughs> Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, generally, if you look at it, there are things talking to the nation of Israel. In Acts chapter 2, we have a new division coming in. It's called the church. And this is where some of the confusion occurs. We take Old Testament, our gospel passages, and apply them to the church. The church age is this. The church age is ageless. We know when it started. When did it start? When Jesus left. When Jesus left, his ascension, that's when it starts. When will it end? When he comes back, where? Not to earth. The rapture never has him coming to earth. In Thessalonians, where we have it described, he meets the saints where? In the air. Aren't you looking forward to that day? Now, when can that occur? Are you sure? I'm just asking, just get you to think that way. Now, say, why speak on this subject? We all basically believe that, Dan. Because there are still people who don't believe. There's still an urgency for the gospel. Many people, even though they may generally believe it, that Jesus is coming back, they don't believe he could come back at any time. If they did, they would change their lives. When I was a boy, and I first heard the gospel and understood it, I had one conclusion in my little brain. I didn't want to go to hell. Now, I didn't know anything about propitiation, justification, all them big $10 words that I now know and like. I didn't know any of that stuff. I just knew as a little 11-year-old boy, I was a sinner. And if things went as they were looking like they were going, when I died, whenever that was, I wouldn't go up. I'd go down. Now, somebody might say to me, Dan, it sounds like you were scared into heaven. Well, call it whatever you want. I didn't want to go to hell. <laughs> and I'm going to say most of you were scared to go to hell. So since you weren't, like, I am not stupid. I want to go to heaven. It sounds like a wonderful place. Why would I choose to go to this place that is torment forever? I wanted to go to heaven. So when the gospel was preached, and I'd heard it probably for a couple months, heard it in the little Sunday school class of a couple little kids, and I believed that if I continued my ways, I was not going to the good place. I just So one Sunday afternoon, riding in the back seat of my parents' 54 Chevy Bel Air, coming off the Skyline Drive, I looked over the bank, as in the Blue Ridge Mountains. I looked over the bank, and I'm like, if my dad crashed, car ran over the bank, What's my chances of heaven? And I knew it was zero. So in the back seat of that old car, I said there, Lord Jesus, save me. I believe. I believe what you're saying. That's when I got saved. Now, honestly, I know a whole lot more now. But that's also when I received the Holy Spirit. Now, I didn't know that. I just knew I believed, and Jesus saved me. And then 
as it was working out, the my whole family it was doing. We I grew up in the South, and so when the preacher, the evangelist, spoke on Sunday night, I and my brother and my mom and my dad we all went forward. Technically, people would say that's when you got saved. I didn't get saved then. I got saved the, that afternoon. <laughs> I just responded and made it public. Going forward didn't save me, had no effect on it. My parents, brother going forward, I personally don't think had any effect. I think they believed when they were sitting in the pews. That's really what I believe. So some would say, well, you got scared into heaven. Well, that's okay, as long as I get there. <laughs> I got scared enough I didn't want to go to hell. Now, over the summer, our people, our nation, continue to go through some tragic events. I'm going to suggest you cannot listen to the news this week without having hearing of someone murdered. I'm just going to say that. Now, I, last week, I know there were two police officers killed in Georgia. I mean, they went to work. Planning to come home to their loved ones, but in the process of their work, they were both murdered. We all know of the story of the, the lady in Tennessee, Memphis, I believe it was, who got up early because she liked to run and was abducted, murdered. All indications I've heard she was probably a believer, and I say praise the Lord. On the other hand, I'm going to say anybody that she didn't. She didn't go to heaven. Everything I know, she went to heaven. I'm going to say I can get on my internet this week, follow the stories I can find on, in Michigan. Somebody is going to go to bed <coughs> with the idea that they will wake up and start another day. And someone will die either tragically or in they just got old like the queen she just got old and she couldn't stop it although she was a queen had been a queen for a long time and we remember this day september 11th maybe above all the days of tragedies in her country in our lifetime because about this time, we were all waking up or else awake and just looking at the TV and say, what in the world has happened? I'm going to tell you, of those almost 3,000 people who either jumped or burned to death or dead of injuries, I'm going to tell you, they went to work that day not thinking that was their last day on earth. Not one of them. All were planning to go home to their loved ones, have a peaceful evening, enjoy wherever they were going to enjoy. But death doesn't take a holiday. And I cannot assure any of you that you will be back tonight. I can't even assure you I will be back tonight. This summer, <coughs> The coach, I think he coached first base for the uh, Toronto Blue Jays. Uh, that's a Canadian team if you don't know anything about baseball. He got a phone, the coach got a phone call that his daughter in Richmond, Virginia had gone on a youth outing and was in the river swimming and had been struck by the boat that her friends were on and she died. I don't know if he's even come back coaching the team now. I'm going to tell you, when she went with her friends, she planned to come home. But I can also tell you, that was her last day on earth. Now, if she was a believer, great. If she wasn't, we know the rest of the story. So why is understanding when the rapture of the church happens 
Why is it important? I mean, I'll get saved after it happens. You're going to bet your money on that one? You're going to bet your life? You're going to survive it? I actually could show you a verse or two that say, I'm not sure you even want to believe then. So it is necessary that we as Christians believe it because it really gives us an urgency. Why does it, not only does it give us an urgency, just think what it does in missions. Why would a young couple sell all they have, take their one, two, three, four, five, whatever number of kids they have, drag them off to the mission field, learn a language that uh, very few people speak, and give their lives to reaching people who have never been reached. Because they believe Jesus can come back, and if he comes back, these people I'm working with, I don't think they'll go to heaven. That's really why you support missionaries. Because you want those missionaries that go, you want them preaching the gospel so that they can get saved. Most of you probably have never been in a village where someone died without Jesus. That's tough. Some of you, though, have been to funerals of people you knew did not know Jesus. I have done funerals of people who died without knowing Jesus. That's not a job you want to do because you really know what's happened. You know this person consistently in this country has refused to believe and now time is up and they're dead. And there's nothing the preacher can do about it. The doctors can't do anything because they are dead without the gospel. Let's stop just a moment and pray. Lord, I, I just make a foolish assumption that everybody here believes. I know Pastor Steve teaches salvation by grace. These people come here because I'm going to say, I'm going to say they probably all believe it, Father, but there may be one here who does not. I pray, Father, through the work of the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit would just burn into their heart that they don't know they're believers. Settle it today with them, Father, in Jesus' name. Now, you might say, well, why would you say, Dan, and pray a prayer like that? I pastored churches where deacons got saved. I remember one came to me, he said, I said, why did you come forward today, brother? And he said, because I'm not your brother. <laughs> he said, I've been sitting here and the gospel has been continually working on me and I have not really believed I want to be saved. One of the first funerals I did as a young preacher, He, the old guy had come to church for years and I knew his wife Florence very well, Florence and Harry. And uh, years they had come to church and I, Harry was in the hospital in Jackson, Michigan and I would go up and see him a couple times a week and one Sunday I'd go in and uh, Harry said, I'm glad you came today. I've got a question for you. So I'm like, what's this old guy got, man? He's done everything in church. What question would he have? He said, I want to know if you can lead me to the Lord. I said, Harry, how long have you been in this church? He said, I'm probably the oldest member. <laughs> and I said, well, wh why haven't you gotten saved? He said, too proud. Too proud. He said, I've been the treasurer. I've been the Sunday school superintendent. I've been everything except the preacher. And I did all them good things, and I figured I was good enough. But I've laid here, and the Lord has revealed to me that I do not really trust him. 
So he said, I want you to lead me to the Lord. And I actually looked at him and said, I won't do it, Harry. I want your wife to do it. <laughs> and so, of course, she did. Didn't take her or me. He, had to, he probably already believed, actually. And that changed his life because he was a very quiet individual. We would almost say shy. Later learned that he was dying from cancer. He didn't know that at the time. But he started witnessing to people. And I'd go in to see him, and he said, Do you bring any gospel tracts today? I want you to leave all your gospel tracts because I want the nurses to hear before they die and go to hell. He changed drastically. So I challenge you, if you're sitting here today and you don't know Jesus, don't miss this opportunity. Now I think we are probably close to the rapture. If you're looking at the chart, it's kind of light. Maybe it's the lights or light. We're at that point, from everything I know, that we're close to the end of the church age. Do not look at the United States as your, as your clock. Well, if this happens, I'll know I'm close. No, no, do not watch the United States. From all the I know and other people who have studied it, have said there is nothing in Scripture about the United States. Now, you can say, well, I kind of think it ought to be. Well, you and I may think it ought to be, but I'm going to tell you, at this point, we don't know of anything. And if you look at the, what, the rate we're going, the way we're going, you might figure out why. I'm not sure even at the end, when Jesus comes for the rapture, if there will even be what we know as the United States. So don't put your hope in this country. If you watch anything, you should watch the nation of Israel. Because Israel is the clock, not the U.S., not the U.N., not the United States, but Israel. So as you look for the things for the rapture of church, remember I said earlier, it's ageless. It's signless. <laughs> there are no signs. The Greeks seek after signs. That's us. We're Gentiles. We're, we're looking for signs. There are no signs except he's coming. Now, in 2 Peter chapter 3, it says this. There will be scoffers in the last days that will say, he hasn't come. And since he hasn't come, I guess he's not coming. Now, who gave us that promise? Jesus. Can you give me a promise that he has not kept? No. If Jesus promised it, he will fulfill it. So, it's ageless. Timeless, there's no time limit to it. Jesus may not come back in the rapture for another 30 years, maybe another 50. Maybe you will see your great great grandchildren. Maybe, just doesn't look very good. So, today, my challenge to you today is it seems weird to even give it to you. Are you ready to meet God today? Are you ready to meet God today, this September 11, 2022? If Jesus came back this afternoon, would you be one of those who would go up? Or you, would you be one of those sitting down here trying to figure out the mess? Let's pray. Lord, it's a simple message. I'm really surprised you put this in my mind and heart. 
somehow apply this to these dear folks at this church. Good people. But I know good people don't go to heaven. Only saved ones do. So I pray you would, if there's one father here who has never believed, or one maybe here who's not sure that today they would settle that issue before you, and we'd ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.